morning. How are you? Good morning. Okay, it's cool. You open your Bibles to Titus. We're going to be in Titus. Titus. Uh, we're just going to go over a general overview of the book of Titus today. Titus. We can start in chapter 1. Uh, Titus chapter 1. And starting out, it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifest. His word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus. So we see who is the writer, the author that is Paul. Actually, it's the Holy Spirit through Paul. And his audience is Titus in particular, the recipient. Uh, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. And verse 5 is going to be a, the purpose statement for why he wrote this book to begin with. Uh, for this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Right, so, when Paul wrote to Titus, um, he wrote in particular for two purposes. And that was, and actually, it, it, even the second one kind of falls under the first, and that is to set in order the things that are wanting, or things that are lacking. Uh, he had sent them to the island of Crete. Uh, which is in the Mediterranean, uh, just a hair west and a bit north of what would be present-day Lebanon. And he had sent them there, had sent him there in particular so that the believers that are there, that I guess are organized into churches, uh, would have the things that they are lacking to be set in order and organized, and in particular also to, that he would ordain elders in every city. So he was looking at beyond just the fact that, okay, they need elders, and then he's going to get specific with that. We'll see that here in our outline as far as, you know, okay, if I'm to set elders, how am I supposed to do that? That would be the logical question that I would ask. And he gives them specifics as to how to go about who he should look for and what kind of, what kind of um, requirements that, that would be necessary for somebody to, to be an elder. But he also addresses the fact, okay, these are some of the things that are lacking. And so the rest of the book is pretty much going to be addressing uh, what are these things that are lacking. In particular, uh, I, I kind of just re really summarized it, and that's, and according to our outline, elders and ones of godly character, which we see verses 6 through 16, uh, that's going to address not just the fact, okay, that he wanted elders, and, but this is what they're supposed to be like. And then basically the rest of the book is going to deal with church family and then how they should act. So in other words, you have the lack of elders. Good morning. Uh, we're in Titus. Titus chapter 1 right now. And that they are to be appointed. And then also the fact that the believers that are there, there's some things that were lacking, lacking in their, in their character and their behavior. He addresses that even in verse 12. He says... One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said that the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Okay. Verse 13, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Okay, that's, kind of, that's, that's pretty convicting. If you have uh, something that is characteristic of your culture, that here's how it's described. Uh, Liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now we don't use that very often, but uh, what what what's a slow belly? What? Yeah, actually, I, I've never heard that before, except just in scripture before. But basically, it's the idea. It'd be somebody that's like a sloth, a slothful. Yeah, the sloth, the sloth drags himself. You know, so he's moving slow and he's crawling on his belly, basically. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> that's. You know, if you get called out on that, that's I, honestly that, to me that'd be pretty convicting, as far as, and then to be somebody that's a that's a liar, you know, an evil beast, somebody that's basically good for nothing, you know, you're, you're worthless, 
just because you have poor character about you. And he says of him, this witness is true. This witness is true. You know, it's not just a rumor. It's not just a, a mischaracterization uh, from folks of other cultures that, oh, well, you know, they, they have um, a snottiness about them that they look down on us, but rather that that's legit. There's nothing to, you can't argue against that. You know? They even admitted it themselves. And uh, here's his remedy for that. He says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Rebuke them sharply. Okay? Instruction isn't always in the form of uh, a pleasant encouragement. Uh, we, if we go to Proverbs, uh, or even you can go to, we see this in Hebrews also, that um, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son that he receiveth. So when we receive rebuke and reproof, uh, that is instruction of life. That is, now it, it's not, as in Hebrews it tells us that uh, it's not joyous, but it's grievous. But afterward, you know, if you're exercised thereby, you receive the peaceable fruit of righteousness. In other words, you'll be developed, you'll be grown by it if you allow um, the, the message to sink in. What God points out in your life to go ahead and, so that you can you can change thereby, so you can be more Christ-like in your character. Um, so, church and family acting as they should. Um, and then the second part would be ordaining elders in every city, and he's going to point out the reason for that. You see basically in verse 5, because it was appointed, he was appointed as such. In other words, that was his, that was his appointment. In other words, God had led Paul to say, hey, look, we need a pastor in every city. So he had an appointment that he needed to fulfill with that. And then because just because of the need. And the need that was there in particular, which is the same need that we have today, is um, he mentions in verse 9 in passing with regard to the, uh, uh, the qualification of somebody that would be a pastor there, um, is that holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Okay, so in other words, God wants the gainsayers, okay, the, the scoffers. He wants those that are not believing, that are attacking there against him, to be one. Uh, God has a heart for those that are lost. I mean, that goes without saying. Uh, if, if you recall when you were lost, if, if, you're, if you're here this morning, born again, you look back and see, okay, how God reached out into your life. You know, the fact is he wants, he wants to do the same with everybody. He wants to use you, by the way, to reach out into others' lives uh, so that they could be drawn to him and they could, they could be brought into the family. And so just because of the need, the gainsayers, God wants to win. And then also, uh, verse 11, uh, he talks about whose mouths must be stopped. This is speaking of those of the circumcision, for they are unruly, vain talkers, and deceivers, uh, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And it's just because you have people that are going about trying to draw people away from God and influence them towards the devil's teachings that you need a pastor, you need somebody that's going to go out and is going to be faithful to preach the word of God, somebody that's going to be faithful to live right, somebody that's going to be faithful to go ahead and lead uh, for the things of God. All right, so as pertaining to us here, I'll go back up to in, um, in the setting the things in order uh, that are wanting, he at first addresses as far as the elders and then the, their character. So we see for an elder, or um, it's used synonymously here as far as like pastor or, or bishop. So it's the same, it's the same concept, basically somebody that's going to be a pastor. Uh, this is what they should be like, uh, beginning in verse 6. Um, if any be blameless, and now he's got to define blameless uh, as, because that's a broad term. What would you, you know, blameless, blameless how, blameless in what way? So here's how the blamelessness should show out. Okay, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. Okay, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. Okay, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, and then holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. 
uh, husband of one wife. All right, literally, it's a one woman man. Uh, Not one at a time. No, <laughs> this would be, this excludes a number of individuals. You can, um, you would have to be somebody that would be obviously of one woman. Now, here's the thing. We go to Matthew 19, where Paul, or Paul, where Jesus addresses the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees that were accusing him and that were trying to, I guess, trap him with regard to the law that they had uh, brought out that, oh, Moses speaks of giving a bill of divorcement. Um, and he says to them, Moses gave them a bill of divorcement because, or he allowed it rather, because of the hardness of their heart. But it, from the beginning, it was not so. And God's heart has always been that, uh, as we see in Genesis uh, chapter two, in the beginning, when he instituted marriage, was that he would have one woman and one man, and they twain shall become one flesh. And what God had put together, that no man put asunder. In other words, unless death parts you, uh, there's no, really, there's no, <laughs> there's no excuse as far as for, for divorce. Uh, if you wanted to argue, play devil's advocate here, if you wanted to argue and say, well, Jesus said himself, okay, you have, uh, except for the cause of fornication, right? From the beginning, it was not so. In other words, God's heart was still not that. He wants the relationship to be reconciled. If you are going to be hard-hearted and continue in that, again, I'm not advocating it because that, that's not what Jesus advocates. But rather, um, the remarriage issue, that's a separate issue. But he specifically addresses that in that he says, if you take one that is uh, already been put away, then you would be committing adultery. So in other words, if you are going to be hard-hearted and go ahead and divorce regardless, the fact is, you're not free to remarry. You know? um, so you can't just, you're free to reconcile with your wife that you've put away, but you're not free to go ahead and just go ahead and pick up and start a new life as if, okay, it never even happened. Uh, but So husband of one wife. Obviously this is gonna eliminate somebody that would be, uh, we don't really see this much here, but like, out west with the Mormons, they allow polygamy. Or even if you go to the Middle East, you have individuals, as far as in Islam, uh, legally, according to the Quran, uh, they have, I guess you could say, legal right to uh, go ahead and marry up to four wives. Um, which I don't know why you would want more than just one. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> but the, you know, the truth is, is, that's that's not God's will. You might want to argue, well, David, you know, had multiple wives. Solomon had 700 and 300 concubines. It was common for kings and you had, to do that. Say again? It was common for kings and, and wealthy to do that in those days. Yeah, but God never advocated that. Well, no, I know. It's true. Yeah. Here's the, here's the funny thing. I mean, Solomon, the wisest man on earth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's going to go ahead and go just to the extreme with regard to that. Why would, you know, why would you? But that's not, again, if you stand before God, you don't have, you don't have any leg to stand on with regard to that issue. So, husband of one wife. He's not going to be somebody that would be divorced. He's not going to be somebody that obviously would have multiple, uh, multiple wives. Uh, he's he's going to be of one wife. He'd be somebody that would be obviously faithful to his wife. And then you have following, uh, he would be blameless in that. Uh, children not accused of right or unruly. Right? So you're not going to have your household out of control. And Timothy, he explains the same thing, and he says it like this in uh, 1 Timothy 3, that uh, if he know not how to rule his own house. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Okay? If your household is out of control, you don't, you're not in a position really to be leading others. 
because they're going to be looking to you as an example of how should I handle my household, how should I handle my marriage, and if you're out of control, you know, <laughs> you know that's you're not you're not most for the most part by and large your folks aren't going to rise above what their leadership is, and if your your leadership's messed up, then those following are going to be at least at the very least as messed up, you know. Uh, but for the grace of God. And so you have to have your household in order. Um, and then he, he mentions this, because this is, this is the underlying uh, philosophy or mentality, is that in verse 7 it says, a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. Okay, so in other words, you, your management of, your, of yourself, of your household, of your uh, obviously of your your uh, family uh, with your wife, uh, that's because you you recognize it as a stewardship. In other words, it's not yours. Yes, obviously she's your wife. You know those are your children, but the fact is those are given to you. Those are gifts to you by God. Um, my boy speaks of the wife that uh, a prudent woman, a prudent wife is from the Lord. You know uh, that. Uh, you know, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtain a favor from the Lord. You know, a godly wife is somebody that is gifted to you by God. You you might have the smooth talk and, and all that stuff, but ultimately, really, it's it's God's grace putting you guys together. And then you know, little children are heritage of the Lord, uh, and the fruit of the room, yeah, uh, the fruit of the room is reward. In other words, though, though they're the product of your marriage. The fact is, they're given to you by God, entrusted to you by God to raise, to want to, to know Him, and to be, uh, as, as He says, to train in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In other words, He wants them to be raised so that there would be a godly seed to continue on, uh, that they would not only just come to know Him, but they would be equipped to live their lives for Him regardless of whether he calls them to be a missionary in some foreign field or just, you know, a computer programmer here in the U.S. or even a, a garbage man. Regardless, he should have character and whatever vocation that, he, that he's led to, to take uh, should be somebody that is going to be active in his local church seeking to win souls, influence people for the cause of Christ, and have a heart that says, yes, Lord, surrender, fully submitted. And that's, that's, that's your job. That's that's a that's a responsibility that's given to you as a as a parent, and he he recognizes that he sees himself as that. Uh, he's a steward. Um, and here's some of the other things that he mentions: not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, not self-willed. It's. Good to be ambitious. You have to be. In other words, in order to be industrious, you should be ambitious, right? You should be somebody that's a go-getter. But the fact is, uh, ministry or any any area of service or life really isn't about you. It's it's about Christ. It's about God. In other words, the 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 pastor, the bishop, is not going to be somebody. At least if he's walking with God, he's not going to be pointing people or drawing him to himself. You know, he might have. A real um, okay. <laughs> just a real great personality to him. But the fact is, um, as Christians, we seek to draw people to Christ and, and not to us. As Paul said, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, we don't worship men, but we we, we worship uh, the living God. You know, who gifts men. And so the thing is, uh, when folks are drawn to a person. And I understand that some personalities are more appealing and, and uh, have, have that draw factor to them. But the fact is they're going to be uh, taking away from, um, you have to guard against that because you want to point people to Christ and not to, not to yourself. You've got to be self-willed because the truth is Christ died for the church. He gave himself for it. And then it's his church, rather. It's not my church or past church, you know. Yes, we take ownership. We ought to be able to see it as, okay, this is 
our, you know, our duty where, where God has, this is our, our body where God has placed us and we have a responsibility to it, but the fact is it's God that is building it. Christ is the one that is the foundation. He's the cornerstone and, uh, you know, no other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, Christ Jesus, the Lord. And uh, we build upon that, but the fact is ultimately it's pointing, it's pointing to him. We're drawing people to him, uh, pointing him to him. And he says of it, not soon angry, not soon angry. Now this is important here because though there's a lot of things, uh, especially um, in this world now, that would cause you to have, I would even say just righteous indignation, the fact is uh, you can't be somebody that is gonna, you know, ready to throw blows at the drop of a hat and you know, you're the one that's gonna be dropping the hat. The fact is, uh, we're to be patient unto all men, you know. As wicked as many men are, uh, and as vile and as in your face as they are with their sin, uh, it's not to be a wimp or back down, but rather, uh, God still wants to win them. <laughs> you know, God still loves them, God still wants to win them. And so, you got to, not let that you have to you have to be self-controlled so that you would not allow that to just go into hot head mode and then just lose an opportunity to be able to go ahead and be effective for the cause of Christ and be able to reach out. Um, not given to wine, not given to wine. Okay, in particular, he's not going to be something that he's he's not going to be somebody that is going to let exterior things influence him. Uh, here's what I mean by that. Okay, you're, we've all seen, well, I, actually even around here, you'll see it a lot. You go to any, any of the number of the gas stations around here, around the train tracks, or just even go down further towards uh, Broward Ave, um, that you have individuals that are just on the street. They come up to your door when you stop at the stoplight. Hey, can, you, can I get a dollar? And you know they reek of alcohol, and they've let that consume their life, and they have other appetites to them that now you know they're homeless. And though you may be more functional, or you may even come across people that are more functional in their addiction, the fact is they have something that other than the Holy Spirit, and they have something other than you know what God has called them to do to be controlling their life. So we're not to be some, we're not to have somebody, we're not to be of the, of the type of individuals that allow these external things to control them. Um, but rather, it should be the Holy Spirit, not wine. Okay, no striker, no striker. No, not soon angry has to deal more with your attitude and no striker is just somebody that is literally, literally no, not a, not a pugilist in other words. He's not just, he's not gonna act out on it. He's not somebody that, we've all probably dealt with somebody like this at some point where he's, uh, you know, you say anything and the next thing you know, okay, he's Mr. Fisticuffs, you know, so you can't, you can't have that, you can't, that's, that's a danger to be around, somebody, somebody, some, somebody like that. Uh, not given to filthy lucre, not given to filthy lucre, now this is interesting, we see this a lot, especially with the TV preachers, or if you go to uh, turn on like TBN and those kinds of things, um, these are individuals that look to fleece the sheep. In other words, they look to take advantage of individuals. These are thieves. Um, and somebody that is in ministry is looking to give and to serve, not to take. Okay? So he should be somebody that is going to be generous, uh, and he's not going to be influenced, again, uh, by something external. Uh, he's not going to be given over to, uh, to money. Ill-gotten gain, literally, is uh, the filthy lucre. Okay, but rather he should be somebody that's a lover of hospitality. Interesting word here, hospitality. That's he's a lover of strangers. He loves strangers, right? So he takes in folks. Um, he loves people. You know why? Because God loves people. Right? He's got to look to the stranger and see them, and have a heart that says, "Hey, come on," you know, because he's going to want to expand. Uh, expand his influence, uh, you know, not because he's trying to build some kind of empire, but rather because it's like, hey, 
I can influence somebody for Christ, and he loves he loves people. Um, you know, and a lover of good men. Uh, mind you, who you are around uh, is going to greatly influence not only just how you think, but also how you behave, uh, what you put up with, what you tolerate. Uh, with regard to that, as far as your close fellowship, so he's going to be a lover of good men. You know, good men being somebody that would, we'll see this year uh, throughout is that somebody that would work hard, somebody that has a heart for God, somebody that's going to be clean living. You know, somebody that's going to seek to have clear conscience uh, in in, uh, in Timothy. He speaks of that. You know, I, I would that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Okay, so somebody's going to be a prayer warrior that is ready, uh, clear conscience, to be able to go ahead and come before God, before the throne of grace, to obtain uh, grace and mercy and to help in time of need. Um, because he's, uh, he's, seeking to, he's seeking to be pleasing to the Lord with his life. And then somebody that is sober, just, holy, and temperate. Now, sober, sober is... Sober-minded. That's not just simply like okay, he's not under the influence, but rather that he is his, he has a serious mind to him. In other words, he he's not um, he's not like a kid that is just running around thinking you know okay, I'm here to have fun and have party. I mean, yes, life life could be enjoyed, life to be joyful. But in other words, he he recognizes the seriousness of the responsibilities that have been entrusted to him and the seriousness of life. Um, you have. Just some, somebody that's right, right living, uh, and then holy and temperate. Okay, self-controlled. Temperate is just basically self-controlled. Somebody that's holy, so he's living, he's living clean, uh, and then holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able to by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Okay, so somebody that's going to be knowledgeable of the word of God, and he's able to rightly divide the word of truth uh, when. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said to this him that, uh, you know, you study to show yourself approved unto God. Okay, so he's not going to be somebody that is looking to gain accolade or, or gain praises from men, but rather he's going to be diligent to study. Uh, and the person that rightly divides the word of truth uh, is the one that is going to be uh, approved unto God. In other words, God's approval on you being able to handle the Word of God comes on how to rightly divide it, how to rightly interpret it. In other words, you can sit there, you can not only just read it, but gain the sense thereof and be able to communicate it to people. Uh, he's got to be somebody, as in Timothy, it also speaks of that he's going to be apt to teach. And that is not just ready to teach, but rather he has an aptitude to teach. He has a heart and he has an actual ability to be able to communicate and take truth and bring it folks so where they can get something from it uh, because God wants you and me he wants everybody to know his word he wants everybody to know his truth and so he's gifted men in that manner and then he, again he wants to, as we mentioned before he wants to gain uh, he wants to gain sayers to be able to be one to him now of that uh, he mentions here or I meant I, I put it I summarize it as this but like uh, these are the things that are set in order. This is the elder and how he's supposed to be. This is the kind of individual that you're supposed to seek out from within uh, this society, basically, <laughs> that are evil, that are characterized by individuals that are evil beasts, slow bellies, and liars. Right? That's kind of get imagine. Wow, how do you <laughs> how do you get that out of this? You know? In other words, how, where are you going to find somebody like this? Well, that's a lot of prayer. And it's not to say that you have nobody that may be qualified necessarily, but that means you need to be very diligent to reach and to educate and to train the folks that are one so that they, he mentions here, rebuke them sharply so that they would be sound. Okay? If you find yourself or if somebody is in this position where they are, you will be slow belly or they don't fit these characteristics, there is hope. I mean, obviously, if they're divorced and remarried, okay, that's different. But as far as the other areas, uh, 
if they haven't been married yet, then there is hope. You can repent. And you can move forward from that point saying, God, you know, by your grace, help me to become a man of this caliber, of this character. And then now he speaks of a church family acting as they should. I summarize it as such, but basically, because basically everything that is mentioned from here forward deals with, okay, this is how church family should act. This is how church family should behave. And then he mentions the different categories in chapter 2. Um, he says, uh, Speak thou the things that become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Okay, so the aged men, this should be something that, this should be characteristic of them. That they're sober, sober-minded, okay? That basically they're realistic about what life is, that it's serious. That though we might have 80 years on this planet, maybe a little bit more than that, the fact is it's very short in comparison to eternity. And that though we have responsibilities here on earth that are temporal, the fact is um, I'm supposed to set my affection on things above and not on things of this world. All right? if, I, and if my life is hid with Christ, if I'm born again, then that means um, me living for that which is temporal. I'm not saying that you don't fulfill temporal responsibilities. I'm saying that you're going to be living with an eternal focus and structuring your life and organizing your life so that that which is uh, eternal takes priority. Uh, then that's, otherwise you'd be wasting, you're wasting your life. And so a sober-minded man is going to be one as such. Okay, he's grave, he's serious, he's temperate, he's self-controlled, he's self-disciplined. Uh, he's sound in faith. And in, the idea sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. This is something that God repeatedly mentions in Scripture about the patience factor. Uh, as we grow, as we mature, uh, if you read through Hebrews, uh, Hebrews in particular, he mentions um, being having faith and patience almost in every chapter of of the book. The overlying or the overarching theme of Hebrews is that Christ is better than. Uh, that was the argument put forth. The believers were being persecuted, and then they were wanting to turn back. And uh, he says, you know, there's no reason for you to turn back. Be going back to the weak and beggarly elements because Christ is better than, and he puts forth the argument, you know, Christ is better than the angels, Christ is better than Moses, Christ is better than Joshua, Christ is better than the high priestly system, and such, and, and then he mentions repeatedly in that as an underlying theme that uh, you need to have faith and patience, you need to exercise faith and patience, and it culminates basically as far as the faith factor, or the faith um, in, in chapter 11. But having faith and patience, because that's how you, in Hebrews 6 in particular he mentions that uh, because of exercising of faith and patience, that's how you receive promises. Um, but having patience, um, Romans 5, that uh, tribulation work in patience and patience hope and, or patience experience and experience hope. And hope make it not a shame, you know, because the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts, or shed abroad in our hearts. And so as a believer, uh, patience is something that God wants to develop and we should have developed as more we mature um, and he expects those that are aged to be sound in that and then in faith and in charity okay not just in the faith but rather in in faith as well in other words your faithfulness to god but as well as your faith in god okay and what i mean by that is you ought to have the younger believers look to you, mind you, as you follow Christ, because we don't worship men, but they ought to be able to look to you and see an example of, wow, you know, how, how do you do that? Or he did that, you know, I can too, uh, as far as faith and, and being able to believe God. Um, you know, you might have a situation, all right, I'll, I, okay, I have a friend of mine. That this is the only. This immediately came to me just because of reading a post that they had put up. Uh, I had a 
friend of mine that is in the Solomon Islands, that he and his wife um, have had three children, but the first two uh, were first two were born stillborn. Okay, uh, and so they they never really they came a little early, but they were basically stillborn. And so the the third child was the, the actual child that I guess survived the whole of the pregnancy. Uh, but you would think, okay, they're only about maybe 25 years old, going to be 26. Um, I don't know if anybody here, I'm, you don't have to raise your hand on this, but I don't know if anybody here has ever dealt with that. Um, but that, that, that would, that's something that would, I can imagine that's very tragic, that's very hard to deal with that. Okay, you prayed for a child and then it, it passes and then you don't, you don't have just that loss and having to go through the burial and then just having to deal with all the emotions that come after that. And then, you know, you have that happen a second time uh, about a year and a half later. And then, you know, you don't know if the third one is, if that's if the same thing's gonna happen or not. But you would see, I would imagine that would wreck most people's lives, you know, just one, but let alone two. Uh, and you ought to, with them in particular, though it's not like they don't have the emotions or they don't have the hurt or they don't have that wound there, God's given them grace to be able to, you know, go through that trial. Um, in particular, they've been able to have a third child now that they're raising that is about just one year old now. Um, there's others where I've seen um, they had a child that came down with leukemia. And so, you know, they prayed for the child to be healed. Uh, they went through all the procedures, and the child passed. God said, no, I'm going to take him. You know? Um, at any, at either one of the situations, you ought to be able to go ahead and trust God and have that confidence and have that grace that he only can give that peace that passes all understanding and be that testimony of faith. You know what? God is still good. His goodness hasn't changed. Even though my circumstance has changed, and even though it's something that would be painful to go through, but my, you know, I'm, I'm making a, a purposeful choice that I'm not going to waver in what I know about God to be true. He's good. He's always been good. That hasn't changed. Okay? Even though right now it doesn't feel like it, He's still good. And be, of those that were aged, the younger should, should be able to see that in us, uh, our faith, and then also our charity, uh, of which Peter says that it, we are supposed to love one another with fervent charity. Uh, now, we're almost out of time. Aged women, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Um, I'm going to mention this. I don't, I'm not trying to skip over that, but verse 16 of chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 14, chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 8, and chapter 3, verse 14, he mentions good works, and in particular that that's something that should characterize the believer. Put them in mind, put them in remembrance. Make sure that they, uh, verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient, uh, and unto every good work reprobate, or in other words, they're useless for, for a good work. This is speaking of the individuals that, uh, that their conscience is defiled and that, um, that are, in other words, that because they've not given, technically it goes back to uh, verse 13. You know, this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth, you know. So in other words, he's, he's telling the, he's, he's rebuking, the, he's telling them to rebuke those believers that are like that, that are the evil beast, slow belly liars, so that they would be sound. And, and rather than give heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth, you, you ought to be giving heed to the truth itself. 
um, and then um, because here's how you end up you end up basically being somebody that is powerless and is useless for God's service in other words you, you can't be used for a good work you know we are in Timothy it tells us that there's some vessels unto honor and some vessels unto dishonor and then if you purge yourself from these you'll be a vessel unto honor meet for the master's use when God calls and he has something that he wants you to do and he puts it on your heart to do boom you're ready to go to be used but you know you can't be ready if you're in sin is what he's pointing out uh, 2 7 says in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works okay and this is speaking particularly to the young men but uh, showing a pattern of good works something that should be characteristic of the believer and then verse 14 in the same chapter, chapter 2, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Okay, zealous of good works. This is something that should characterize us as well, that we ought to be looking to do good and be zealous of doing good. Chapter 3, verse 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Wow, that's... <laughs> Uh, fifth time right there that he mentions that. Verse 8, uh, or fourth time, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Okay, these things are good and profitable unto men. And then verse 14 of the same chapter, and let, us, let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. At six times, if I'm not mistaken, that God mentions the Holy Spirit through Titus or through Paul to Titus concerning the issue of good works. This is something that should characterize us, and this is something that we need to be mindful of. That should be in our life that we should be looking to do, looking to serve in some capacity. Uh, the good works profitable unto men. Uh, it's also something that produces fruit. Okay, not just immediate, as he says, for necessary uses. Uh, but that they would not be unfruitful. In other words, you know, uh, even a cup of cold water given in his name, you know, he's not going to, he's, he's going to reward. Uh, Christ is going to reward. And so we want to be able to stand before him uh, at the Bema Seat, at his judgment seat, with gold, silver, precious stone. This is something that we should be mindful of. And this is something to which Titus was written to, in particular, that this is supposed to be set in order. Church family acting as they should. Um, seeking to do good works, seeking to be of the good character, seeking to uh, seeking to teach the younger and such. Um, so, what's our lesson for today? What's our lesson to, for today? How can we learn from this, from Titus? Are we seeking to be those that work good? Are we of the same character? Uh, of these that were called out as being evil, be slow bellies or liars. Mm -hmm. And if you are, if you find yourself in that position, you know, you need to repent. And you can change. God gives grace to be able to change. That's the whole reason for him even to be rebuking them. You know, if God was through with them, God was going to be done with them, he would just take them out, but he didn't. And then, how is our faith? How is our charity? Uh, how is our patience? Next week, we are going to uh, be looking at the uh, book of Philemon. And then, uh, following that, I want to do on uh, Ken Ham's, uh, where, where the Ken Ham's uh, One Blood. All right, so we are uh, dismissed. Hey, how are you? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? Oh, she's working for the day. Does this work okay yeah. there? Or is it happy? Yeah, she's, she's oh, seeing her parents. Oh, that's no, good. Yeah. Yeah. She's here all the time. Yeah. Yeah. She's here yeah. the past yeah. three times. Yeah. 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 That's why. Yeah. Yeah. How are you? Last Saturday. Oh, that's good. I haven't gotten the... Supper time.